So I think we'll get going. Uh, people can catch up and ask questions after. I'm Larry Robbins. Uh, I'm a neurologist and headache doc a little north of Chicago. And I have a number of articles out on the CGRP meds, um, the side effects and the efficacy, the good and the bad. I have another one coming out in a month that I'll post on this group, uh, focusing more on uh, the side effect aspects. But on my website, if you just uh, Google me, the website pops up and at the top is one of the buttons for CGRP articles. Also, there's this um, nice magazine, online journal, practicalpainmanagement.com. Uh, that's all one word, practicalpainmanagement.com. They have a ton of headache articles, pain articles. Uh, they also have um, a lot of our articles. You can Google, there was an article we did last March on the side effects and switching, what happens when we switch that uh, did not make it onto my website. So today we'll be talking about the newer treatments, uh, monoclonals plus G pants, et cetera. The monoclonals have been around for a year and a half, a little longer, and they've been fairly successful uh, efficacy wise. We have at least 50% of people get 50% better with monoclonals. Sometimes they wear out. We have the three monoclonals that you know about very well, Amavig and HOV and Imgality and a newer one coming, which is intravenous that I'll mention. But uh, the side effects have been problematic short term. And of course we don't know long term. So I'll, I'll get into the side effects, but the efficacy has been pretty good you can use those with Botox. The efficacy, which is effectiveness, is about as good as Botox. Each helps 50-60% of people. Sometimes we combine Botox and the monoclonals and we get 70-80-90%. There are super responders who do well, very well on the monoclonal antibodies, those three, and then there are people who don't have any results at all. Then we have the G pants, which are as needed abortives. The new one that just came out, Ubrelvi, which is Ubrojapant, uh, has just been around for two weeks now. And the advantage of these we'll go into, but they don't tend to affect the heart. So in higher risk categories, um, they'll be good, or in people who don't like the triptans, who don't stay on triptans. Triptans are our number one. That's sumatriptan, risatriptan. There are seven of them. They're all generic now. Uh, Treximid is a combination of sumatriptan and naproxen. And they're first line. But about uh, at least half the people don't like triptans or drift off of them or they don't work well enough. And then we need other options. So what are the other options? They're not great. We have NSAIDs. We have Cambia powder. Uh, which is uh, a powdered diclofenac, a powdered NSAID, which works pretty well. We have Excedrin and the over-the-counters. We can still get Midrin, Prodrin, uh, which is isomethaptane compounded at the compounding pharmacies, but most docs don't know about that. And we still have the older ergotamines, particularly DHE. The problem is that DHE works by far the best as an injection and it's gone from cheap to expensive. Uh, Dihydroergotamine, which is DHE, is actually quite a safe drug. It's called an ergotamine, but it's different pharmacology from the older Cafergod and Cafergod PB. Uh, DHE doesn't actually shrink the arteries, so it's actually pretty safe. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, as disclosure, I do speak uh, for several of these companies. Um, I'm on their speakers bureau. So the G pants, Ubrelvi just came out and they don't affect the heart really. Um, the newer one that will come out probably eventually will be Remegipant. We expect an approval anytime now. And eventually one or two of these are going to be used as daily preventives, but they're not for prevention. They're just as, as needed. Then we have a newer class that's basically a triptan, but they call it a ditan. And lismiditan, lismiditan, 
is the one that was just uh, approved. Revow is the name, R-E-Y-V-O-W. And Revow, lasmiditan, also doesn't really affect the heart. And its niche is similar to the G-Pants in people who don't like the triptans or have too many si um, risk factors for cardiac. There is um, a newer device out, Nerivio, N-E-R-I-V-I-O, that I think is, is really not bad. It goes on the arm. It's about $99 for, uh, you get about 12 to 25 or 30 headaches out of it. So it tingles and it sends signals up into the bottom of the brain, the brainstem, and overrides a headache. Um, we've had some success with it. They have some good studies. It does require a prescription. So that's an introduction to the main things that we'll talk about tonight. And now some of the questions. Are the new abortive medications safe to take while on heart medication? They, they are in general. Um, if people have heart risk factors, I would rather have them on a G-Pant like Ubrelvi or on Revow, Lesmiditan, because theoretically they don't affect the heart. Another question, are they safe to take if you have a heart condition or have had a stroke? In general, yes, unless they raise the blood pressure or there's some side effect, but that's the niche, that's the side effect of these. Uh, that's the um, advantage of these, is that we're, if we don't want to use a triptan, sumatriptan or rizotriptan, and in all fairness, triptans for 28 years now have been very safe. There are some theoretical risks though, if people have a lot of risk factors, if they have angina or they had a heart attack, we'd rather not use a triptan if we can avoid it. Another question, can Ubrelvi or Revow or Remegipan help with chronic migraine or just episodic migraine? And they're used for either. They're not used as preventives, so they're not going to be differentiating chronic versus episodic migraine. Chronic migraine is basically 15 days a month or more with a headache. Another question, if somebody's taking CBD or THC, is Ubrelvi contraindicated or does it need a no dose modification? So CBD and THC are interesting. The way that we look at metabolism of drugs, there's a number of pathways that drugs get out of the system. One is going through the liver, and it's called the CYP450 CYP enzyme system. And CBD and THC do affect the CYP450 enzyme system. They are what we call inhibitors of the enzyme. So they can prevent the enzyme that breaks down these drugs from working as well, so that you have higher levels. So which ones go through this um, liver system? A lot of our uh, cardiac drugs, a lot of our pain drugs do. And Ubrelvi, the new one, is uh, goes through the CYP450, it's called 3A4 pathway. CBD and THC can inhibit that, but we have such wide variations of strength of CBD and THC, depends on the strain, and also, there's a question how strong inhibitors these are, uh, CBD and THC. There's different sources that say they're a mild to moderate inhibitor. Some others say they're moderate to strong. So it gets really complicated. Ubrelvi, though, the new one is broken down by 3A4, that liver. So there are drug interactions. Not that many, but some of the other inhibitors are the strong antifungal drugs. Um, some of the uh, HIV drugs, and some macrolide antibiotics such as erythromycin, et cetera. And then there's some other interactions like with topiramate or the older dilantin or phenobarbital, tegretol, things like that. But uh, the, the um, newer one, lasmiditan, uh, Revao has several mechanisms for going and getting metabolized in the body and the drug interactions are not uh, that crucial. It's not like one liver enzyme. But the original question, CBD and THC, they do affect these liver enzymes. How much? 
I don't think that it's known because the strength and the, the strain of these varies so widely. Another question, are the G-pads safe to take with CGRP injectables or with a new one, eptinezumab, or we call it epti, which will be intravenous? And right at the moment, there's no contraindication for G-pads uh, with the monoclonal injections, but there may be in the future. We don't know. It's, it's unclear. It may be too much CGRP inhibition. At the moment, there's no contraindication for using these. Do the G-pads cause rebound like the triptans, and what's the maximum number? There's no official maximum number. The Ubrelvi comes in a packet of 10. And the way the copay card works, if you have commercial insurance, it should pay it down where you only have to pay $10 for 10 of them. But the pharmacy has to run it through your insurance first, it gets turned down, and then run the card. So the card goes to the company, the company basically will pay it, and they'll pay 13 of these in a year. So you could fill the 10 more than once a month, but you're limited to 13 pills of 10 pills. But there's no official high-end ceiling to how many pills of Ubrelvi or Ravau. Now the issue of rebound is complicated. Rebound is medication overuse headache or withdrawal headache. And I'll give you my view. I've published articles on this. I think that rebound and medication overuse headache, withdrawal headache is overdiagnosed and poorly defined. The older definitions basically said if you have 11 or more days a month where you take this type of medicine, 15 or more days of that type, you have medication overuse headache. And they conflated and confused medication overuse headache, MOH, with medication overuse, MO. So however we want to define medication overuse, whether it's 11 days of tryptan and NSAIDs or 15 days of this and that, uh, it's an artificial designation. It doesn't mean that people are having headache from that. So the high caffeine drugs like Excedrin are more likely to cause rebound, opioids, and butalbital drugs. So we use those. We use opioids and butalbital, but as a last, last resort, if everything else that we can reasonably use or people can afford uh, has not worked. So they shouldn't be a first or second line resort at all. But medication overuse headache is difficult to diagnose. People need to be taken off of their drug, seeing what happened, also a careful history. What happened when you went on the drug? Did your headaches accelerate? Do you get a headache the next day from the drug? And this was not captured in epidemiologic studies, which are how some of the medication overuse headache studies have done. They said, well, they looked at 100,000 people, sent surveys, and decided that such and such amount of people percentage have medication overuse headache. And I don't uh, think that that's entirely valid. So at any rate, the second half of the sentence, I always say is not answered. The first half is, okay, you tell me doctor not to take this, don't take that, don't take more than two days a week of this, two days of that, uh, or four days a month. I have headaches seven days, I have to work, I have two kids, what am I gonna do, what do I take? That's the second half of the sentence, it's not answered. Because our preventives are generally not good enough. Our preventives are better now, we have the monoclonals, we have Botox, topiramate came about many years ago, um, but they're still not very good. Even for Botox, even for the monoclonals, half the people I would guesstimate a little less probably 45%, don't find a preventive that works long-term, that they can afford, that's going to work. So people end up taking too many abortives, not because they like the drugs. You don't get high on Excedrin um, or most of these drugs, but it's because they help their headache and they can function. Some do lapse into medication overuse headache, but I think it's overdiagnosed. I don't think the g pants are going to end up causing medication overuse headache. We don't know about Ravau, Lesmiditan yet, but there's no indication that G-Pants do, but it's not proven. This is all a little bit early and murky. Another question, how many Revow is it safe to take uh, per month, et cetera? Revow just came out, Lesmiditan. 
<clears throat> it was um, considered Schedule Five, which is a mildly controlled substance. So. The way that they figure scheduled or controlled substances somewhat is they give the drug like they did with Revow to 50 or 60, uh, they gave Revow I think 56 patients who have had a drug issue in the past, poly drug abusers, and they compare it say to Xanax. And with Revow, certainly in 200 milligrams, people did like it, some got euphoric, so they decided to schedule it as Schedule 5. That's the mildest controlled substance, but it is a controlled substance, which will inhibit prescribing a little bit. Uh, schedule 1, it, the DEA schedules these along with the FDA, but Schedule 1 is uh, like heroin and LSD. Schedule 2 is OxyContin, hydrocodone. Three is Tylenol with codeine and ketamine. Four is Xanax and Tramadol. And five is the mildest. And there's some drugs in there that you wouldn't think would be scheduled or controlled like Lyrica or Viberzi, which is a diarrhea drug, but they are. And they decided to schedule Revo just the other day. So it's coming out. Revo will be in packets of eight. We don't know yet how well the copay cards will be. And it's the first of its class called a ditan, similar to triptans. Ravau works at the serotonin 1F receptor. Most of our triptans, or all of them, work at B and D, which do affect the heart or heart arteries a little bit, although we do have 28 years of safety. Uh, it's been excellent with the triptans. But Ravau is a little bit different. It doesn't affect those. So say somebody's 72 years old or 62, with high blood pressure, cholesterol, nothing's that well controlled, but it's not way out of control, we might consider Revow or Ubrel-V as opposed to a triptan with higher risk patients. Revow had reasonably good studies, about 28% after two hours were pain-free, which is pretty good, and about 60% had pain relief at two hours. The uh, Ubrel-V, had reasonable studies, but the two hours is 20% pain-free, but uh, up in the high 50s to 60% uh, as far as pain relief. And Ubrelvi over hours two to eight uh, gets better by hour eight. There was relatively little. And interestingly enough, you Ubrelvi, you can take two doses a day. Um, it's 50s and 100s. You can take two of the 100s or 450s actually, you can take up to 200 milligrams a day. The Revow came out as a once uh, a pill prescription, uh, once a day, and that's it. It's not that it's long acting. Both of these have five to seven hour half lives. It's that Revow, uh, they found that adding in another pill a few hours later did not seem to increase the efficacy. The Ubrelvi, it did. So Ubrelvi is indicated for several doses a day, rave out for one a day. Um, clinically, we'll have to see how this all plays out. When I say half-life, that's the amount of time for a drug, for half of the drug to be metabolized and get out of your system on average. So five to seven hours, that means after five to seven hours, if you start out with, uh, say, 100 grams in the bloodstream, you'll have 50 on average. So in another five to seven hours, you'll be down to 25% and then 12%. So this is how we look at how drugs get out of the system. Some very fast acting ones have short half lives um, or they're fast to get out of the system like sumatriptan has a one hour half life. And then you do have some drugs, Rexalti for depression, phenobarbital, uh, uh, Aripiprazole, Abilify, that have 90-hour half-lives. Prozac, fluoxetine has 80, 90 hours. So we look at, we pay attention to half-lives. Sometimes long half-lives are a big advantage to us, sometimes short are, and sometimes they're a disadvantage. So another question, are we like to, likely to see similar side effects to the g pants as we see with the CGRP injectables, that's Amovig, Mjovi, Mgality, such as constipation, hair loss, et cetera? 
And I'll talk about side effects to the monoclonals in a little bit, but essentially, no, I don't think we're going to have a lot of side effects that are similar because these are five to seven hour half-lives that the monoclonal antibodies stay in your body all month long. They all have 27 to 31 day half-lives. The new one that is going to come out at some point, the injectable FT uh, from Alder, or now it's Lundbeck, they were, Alder was bought out by Lundbeck, I think. Um, that has a 31-day half-life. But these are all long. The Ubrelvi and Remegipant, which has not come out yet, and Ravau have five to seven hours half-lives, and they're not going to be used every day. They'll be used once or twice a week on average. So it's not like this constant. But I don't think, unless we start using them every day in the future, which we... Uh, don't do now that the G pants will have the same side effects. Uh, the G pants have been relatively well tolerated in studies, but studies are studies and real life is real life, and I'll talk about that later. Uh, the Ravow does have dizziness, is a major side effect, and so is tiredness. There's a question any concerns for long term side effects? And absolutely, I think that. Any new class, any monoclonal antibody, any new class of medicine, we're very concerned about long-term side effects. CGRP is ubiquitous throughout the system. Um, there is CGRP in almost all of our tissues. It's replete throughout the brain. So evolution deemed it in the last two, three million years. Actually, CGRP has been around in other species for um, maybe 100 million years. Uh, but evolution deemed this molecule to be very important in a lot of areas. So we can't think that blocking it forever is going to lead, lead us to no side effects. How serious they are, whether we have long-term ones, um, remains to be seen. Amgen does have some studies over five years on some patients on these without long-term, but it's going to take a long time to figure that out. Another question, do the g pants or Ravau cause serotonin syndrome? So serotonin syndrome is a source of huge confusion. It's when you have too much serotonin in your body from drugs, um, sometimes a food interaction with a drug, such as an MAO inhibitor and tyramine uh, foods, and you get some serious complications, high blood pressure, sweating, fever, you have to be in the intensive care unit. Ser True serotonin syndrome is a medical emergency. You need to be in the ICU. Unfortunately, it got in the PIs, uh, the package inserts for triptans, or seven triptans, like sumatriptan, riazotriptan, along with SSRIs and antidepressants. SSRIs are serotonin reuptake inhibitors that raise serotonin, and subsequent studies on hundreds of thousands of people have shown that we're probably not more likely to get serotonin syndrome than just with SSRIs alone. It's very rare. There have been letters to the editor trying to get this out of the package insert. It's extremely rare. In 28 years of using triptans, I've never seen it, and we I've written on daily triptans. We've written about use in daily, which is not ideal, but it's a last resort. But sometimes um, I think that serotonin syndrome is um, overdiagnosed a bit, um, but uh, it, it's relatively rare. I do not think that g pants or Ravau are any material risk for, for this. Um, so there's not a contraindication to using them with antidepressants. Another question, if the abortives don't work with the first or second dose, is it worth taking another dose the next day? Well, the next day is a continuation usually of this migraine, but if whatever abortive we took today worked or works and the headache comes back, we'll use that abortive because we don't have a lot of other choices. So the only time that we switch medicine for long, severe, like long prolonged menstrual headaches, which tend to be the worst and long Sometimes we'll use a little bit of cortisone, not too much. The idea with steroids, prednisone, dexamethasone, medrol, 
are to use little doses, tiny amounts, one or two pills every six, eight, 10 hours. Um, and we limit them greatly per day and per month. Another question, did the trial show any difference between migraine with aura and migraine? And did it show difference in women versus men? And generally, the answer is no. Um, most of the abortives are used with aura, without aura, aura. And most of the studies are predominantly women, 80% women or 85%, and not that many men, but there weren't huge differences that, that I'm aware of. Are any of the abortives safe to take with all of the antidepressants? The only antidepressants that we worry about are the MAO inhibitors. They're not used very much anymore. Um, like the older ones, Nardil, which is phenolzine. Those are very good for depression, some depressions, and they're good for um, sometimes for pain, for headaches, but they're basically a last resort. Very few people are on them anymore, but the regular antidepressants and these drugs, I think, are relatively safe. Can any of these abortives be taken in the same day as a triptan? Well, the rescue medicine in the studies for GPANs for Ubrelvi was anything that helped people, so triptan. So you can take a triptan in the same day as Ubrelvi, which is a GPAN. I wouldn't take them at the same time, but we spread them out usually three hours, four hours apart. Ubrelvi is indicated to take one dose and then another if you need it two or three or four hours later and 200 milligrams a day at most. The Ravau actually has two doses, 50 and 100, but some people need, will need 200, which does cause a lot of dizziness. We'll try 50 to start, and you can take up to 200 milligrams in a day. The uh, Ravau, is it different from the triptans? It really is, I mentioned that. It's called a ditan. It works at that 1F receptor, which does not theoretically affect the heart or increase risk for a stroke at all. So moving along with um, questions, there's another one. If one of the CGRP injectables did nothing, increased MI, uh, migraine or caused bad side effects, is it worth trying the G-Pants? I think it's somewhat apples and oranges. The side effect profile that I see from the monoclonals, I think is going to be somewhat different from the G-Pants because the G-Pants have a short half-life and are not going to be used every day. But we'll see over time. If the preventive uh, injectables work well, is it more likely that the G-Pan abortives will work? And that does not follow. So you can prevent the headaches with the injections of Amavig, Mgality, Ajovi, but not necessarily get help from the G-Pans and vice versa. Uh, so if a CGR P preventive did not work out, it may still would be worth trying the G pants um, if we need to. Another question about RAVO scheduling. Uh, why was it scheduled and what's the ramification? The only ramification really is it's a little hard to get. Some doctors are queasy about scheduled medicines. They don't want to, uh, to prescribe something that is controlled or they have limits. The RAVOUT came out, as I mentioned a little bit ago, as a Schedule 5, which is the mildest schedule, but it is unfortunately a controlled uh, substance. Uh, another question about, are these coming out in Europe and Canada and elsewhere? So my understanding that Ubrelvi uh, is not uh, under consideration at the moment in Europe and Canada, it may be, or they may be going to submit it, but I don't think that it has been. I did see something about Ravau in Europe, but I'm not sure. They, But these have all come out in the United States first. The monoclonal antibodies are in many countries. Canada, they came out not that long after the United States. But it depends on which country. In UK, they've, because of insurance, they've been uh, fighting the distribution of the monoclonal antibodies. Uh, will the, Another question, will they be used for heart conditions? Yes, I think they'll, not for heart conditions, but in patients with various heart conditions. 
are they going to do studies on this? We don't know if they'll do post approval studies, probably uh, somewhat. Uh, are they going to do studies for these drugs on chronic pain? I don't believe so. But in adolescents or younger than age 18. So they will, and they're doing studies. There have been a few in monoclonals. I have great reservations about CGRP drugs in adolescents, like I do in adults also. But there is a lot of CGRP in our brain and hormonal areas. And we don't get a lot of penetration from the big molecules, the, the injectables into the brain. We get about uh, 0.2 to 1%, but I think they do affect the brain. There are five key areas of the brain that are not protected from what we call the blood-brain barrier. Uh, so drugs can get, that even large molecules, one like the injectables, can get in more easily. And those are, two of the crucial areas are the part of the hypothalamus, and the posterior pituitary. Those are crucial. They have all of our hormones, a lot going on in there. And I think the drugs may influence uh, some people there. I, I, I have real reservations about all of these drugs in uh, adolescence until we really know uh, that they're safe. So I'll talk about, um, I wanna talk about how we look at side effects. Um, the studies are pretty good with efficacy. They hold up pretty well. Um, we have a lot of scales for efficacy. And they're what we call powered for efficacy. The studies are have enough patients and are a long enough time for effectiveness. Side effects, not so much. So there's a number of reasons why the side effect profile comes out in a package insert and a year later, five years later, it's widely different and this is what we're, that's what we're seeing with the monoclonal antibodies. I've written a lot of, um, I know a lot of you have communicated with me about this. Um, six months ago, uh, some people on some of the chat boards and some doctors were a bit upset with me about writing about all the side effects and the last couple months that's turned around. Uh, they say, you know, we actually see a lot of side effects. So I want to go into how side effects are acquired because this is important. Uh, a package insert comes out clean with nothing. A year later, we see tons of side effects. So there's a number of reasons. They're not powered for side effects. They don't have enough patients and not long enough. They don't use a checklist. So in your typical study, and we've done many, many studies for decades, somebody comes in, Sally comes in, She's in the study and I say, Sally, how you been doing on the injection, on the Amavig, on the HOV? Okay. Any side effects? No, not really. When we give a checklist of, say, 18 possible side effects that have commonly popped up, all of a sudden people say, you know, my hair is thinning and I think I've been losing it. And I think it started right after I went on the injection or I've never been depressed and I took that injection and I've been depressed. So we find more if we use a checklist. We just finished writing up this checklist study. It'll be out in a month and I'll post it here. It's very interesting. Um, another major reason is disaggregation. So by that, I mean, we have one word, uh, we have more than one synonym for the, um, basically the same problem. So you take fatigue. Uh, Rayvow just came out and it had uh, several synonyms for fatigue. I think it was tiredness or somnolence and then fatigue um, and each might be 4% or 5%. Well, they get minimized then, but it's actually the same problem. It might end up being six or eight or 10%, but because you have different words for it, each has 2% and it gets shoveled under the rug. By the way, it's not really the company's fault for these side effect uh, problems. The uh, FDA does mandate basically how side effects are acquired. And you couldn't do a study long enough with enough patients to be powered for side effects. You would need three to 6,000 patients for a long time. And uh, it's hard enough to get 1,000 patients or 900 for six months. 
But there are other reasons why side effects become minimized. The patients in studies tend to be a little milder than in real life. They're cherry picked in some sense a little bit. Uh, there's a marvelous online journal, Quarter Watch. And it's edited and written mostly by Tom Moore, who is uh, one of the leading experts in the world in acquisition of side effects. He wrote the chapter in the main book. And in Quarter Watch, in August, they reviewed the monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and in December, he just did an interesting thing too. So it's free, Quarter Watch is a free nonprofit. You have to register, but it's a very interesting if you're interested in acquisition of, uh, of side effects and why we miss them. So what happens? How do we figure out the real side effect profile? Well, it takes multiple lines of evidence post-approval. You need doctors' comments and experience. You need whatever studies post-approval and case reports. You need the FDA website, which is F-A-E-R-S, is the website where they uh, list side effects. And as of September 30th, I'm waiting for the December 30th uh, stats on the FAERS website. There were about 22,000 side effects, possible side effects reported to the monoclonal antibodies and about uh, 2,800 or more serious ones. And undoubtedly, that was September 30th. So in the next four months, this is a lot of side effects, but it gets tricky. We don't want to count every side effect um, unless we're pretty sure that it's uh, from the drug and all the ones on the FDA website are not necessarily, they're just something that may have happened. It, it gets really tricky. Uh, we're trying to differentiate between adverse event is anything on the drug and adverse effect, which is actually from the drug. And it's an important distinction. So along the side effect uh, route, we also looked at patient comments. Uh, and what patients say and doctors say. So we put all this together and I actually have done that. And the side effect profile in uh, my mind and what I've written about lines up with all these different for the monoclonal antibodies. So I think we're getting a more realistic picture anyways than a year and a half ago of the side effects. So another question, uh, is it okay to take an anti-emetic uh, with you, V or any of the new ones? Antiemetics are for nausea, such as ginger or ondansetron, which is Zofran, or the older, stronger ones, promethazine. Ondansetron is the only one that doesn't cause tiredness, along with ginger. And you can get ginger capsules. Uh, you don't have to take ginger. Um, and the older ones, promethazine, metoclopramide, prochlorpyrazine, which is compazine, uh, they tend to cause tiredness, but sometimes they work really well. But you can take them with these drugs. Uh, another question, are we likely to see side effects of the G-pants compared with those side effects emerging, emerging from the CGRP? So as I mentioned, I think it's unlikely, um, but we don't know uh, long-term what we're going to find with the G-pants. Uh, another question, rescue medicine, is it okay to take ketorolac or other similar. Ketorolac is a strong anti-inflammatory. It's a very good drug. We don't want to overuse it. A lot of our side effects tend to be from anti-inflammatories, stomach, kidneys. Last year, uh, at least 60,000 people died primarily, partly because of anti-inflammatories, either causing kidney damage or bleeding out of the stomach. But they're very useful because the anti-inflammatories which is naproxen, Aleve, or ibuprofen, Advil, or the stronger ones like Ketorolac, are not addicting and they don't cause tiredness. So particularly in younger people, as you get older, these are more risky with kidneys and the stomach. Another question, how likely will it be that Remedjapant, which is not out yet, will be available or working as a preventive. They're working on studies on remedjapan as a preventive, but it's going to be a while till they decide what to do or the FDA decides what to do. It's not been submitted yet. Remedjapan will probably first come out as an as needed, what we call an abortive, like the Ubrelvi. A few questions on eptinezumab, which is from Alder, Lundbach, Epti we call it. Uh, it's an intravenous every three months, 
that's a disadvantage. You have to go in 20 or 30 minutes, uh, but you don't have to give yourself a shot every month. It works well, relatively fast, faster than um, the others. It might work in a day or two. It has a long half-life of 30 days, so it may last quite a while, and you get higher blood levels with Epti. So there will be some advantages. Uh, there's big disadvantages, intravenous, it's the fourth on the market. So most patients will have tried uh, the regular injectables first. Another question on the half-life of Epti and the other monoclonals, these all, as I mentioned, does have, do have 27 to 31 day half-lives. Uh, so these are long acting drugs. The Amavig attaches to the receptor uh, of CGRP. CGRP is calcitonin gene related peptide and around the head, it causes inflammation, swelling, and that feeds into the bottom of the brain, which then irritates the thalamus. The thalamus is your relay center. The thalamus then tells your cortex, particularly it starts with the back of your head, the occipital cortex, to have a migraine. So it starts in a lot of people out, and CGRP is part of that process, so we're dampening down CGRP. The others, um, as far as the monoclonals, Ajovi and uh, Mgality work on the ligand itself, the actual CGRP molecule itself. Uh, now these newer ones, the G-pants are big molecules. They can penetrate into the brain a little bit more, which is good and bad. And the Ubrel-V is actually attached to the receptor, just like Amavig does. We don't know if there's going to be differences between the G pants that much, and also we're trying to parse out differences between the different monoclonal antibodies. Uh, there's a um, another question on the side effects of uh, the uh, G pants uh, and the monoclonals. I think that the side of, the main side effects of the monoclonals. Um, that we talk about, which is the Amavig, et cetera. Um, our tiredness, some people are very tired, joint pain, sometimes hair, hair loss or hair thinning. We have depression. We have sometimes anxiety or insomnia um, and other annoying side effects and then some serious side effects. And I don't think that patients are um, under-reporting or over-reporting. I think that um, a certain percentage of people cannot take these drugs because of side effects. And unfortunately, once you use the injection, sometimes the side effects linger. The injections are long acting, or if you have a very sensitive nervous system, say to nausea and depression, and you get an injection and it starts that whole process, it can continue. There's no guarantee that these are going to go away. Uh, are there any updates on uh, newer side effects? Uh, people are asking about the injectables. And uh, as I mentioned, Quarter Watch is very good. They're August um, and the FDA website. It's not easy to parse through the FDA FAERS website, but you can. But like with a lot of the monoclonals uh, for cancer or rheumatoid arthritis, they come out with a very thin package insert with very few side effects, and a year or two later, uh, that's greatly um, changed. So I wanted to finish formally yapping. Uh, if people are a little later, we have a lot of CGRP info. I have on my website, if you just Google me, towards the top is CGRP, and also in, I like this journal, practicalpainmanagement.com, a lot of CGRP stuff and headache stuff, and um, also that quarter watch I mentioned. Those are all free online accesses. So why don't we open it up to uh, any questions and I'll try to answer um, uh, some questions. There's a question, um, if somebody has severe migraine, can an approved abortive be used um, at wake up, and you can use these abortives relatively often. You're only going to be able to get 
8 Ravau and 10 Ubrelvi with a fill. So it's not like we can get a huge amount. Cryptans, particularly through good RX, because they're generic, you can get Sumatryptan uh, pretty cheaply. 50 cents, 60 cents a pill. I have a headache and, well, a neurology and psychiatry clinic that I set up in rural Honduras. Uh, we have a lot of videos and stuff on our website about it. It's a free clinic. We bring in 10,000 pills of sumatriptan at a time. It's great because we can get them here pretty uh, cheaply. Uh, there's a question about Toradol. Uh, Toradol comes, uh, which is ketorolac, as an injection that you can give yourself a nasal spray called Sprix and the tablets. And as you might imagine, the tablets are the mildest. Sprix works secondary, um, intermediate, and then the injections work the best. And there's two types of injections. IM that you can do at home, usually into the leg, or IV in an office. And ketorolac is useful because it's a little bit stronger of an anti-inflammatory and you can combine it with other things such as uh, pain medicine. There's a question about topiramate, 300 milligrams and ubrelvi. There is an interaction. Topiramate in higher doses, over 100 milligram, is what we call an inducer of CYP450 enzymes, particularly 3A4 and 2D6. So what does that mean? It means that if you're on 150 or 200 or 300 of topiramate and you go on a drug, it might chop up the drug and induce the enzyme where you get lower blood levels. So 100 milligrams of ubrelvi on that topiramate might actually just look like uh, 50 milligrams or 25. So there is an interaction there. And there's a question about Medicare type D, Part D. Usually it takes six months. You probably, it's gonna be another five and a half months, I believe, till they can apply or so to uh, most of the Medicare. It takes a while to get on these. As we've seen, the monoclonal antibodies injections, uh, Amovig and HOV and Galati, we do get some coverage with Part D. And I expect that to happen. Unfortunately, it's going to take a while. And the, one of the big niches uh, for these drugs is the over age 60, 65 population. The myth is that everybody's headaches go away in their 50s. I tell people it's about 45% chance that they're going to get a lot better. Sometimes they go away. Most people continue. Many people start getting headaches in their 50s and 60s. We have new onset daily persistent headache, NDPH, in the adolescence. We also have it in 75 and 85 year old age range. And we need drugs for those. But unfortunately, uh, it's going to take a while for Medicare Part D. We also need more written about the very old. We have some written about medication use in the elderly. Defining elderly is always funny. When I wrote, uh, I was a young kid. I was um, 30 or 33. I wrote this first book, Management of Headache uh, and Headache Medications, and eventually went into other editions. And uh, I, I had a chapter on the elderly in there. And I defined elderly, I think, is after 50, because when you're 33, 50 looks elderly. Now that I'm elderly, I keep moving up the uh, age of elderly. But we really do need more written for medication use 65 to 75, but also 85 to 100. A lot of people do get conditions and they get headaches and what can, what can we use them? But it's a problem with these drugs uh, until Medicare Part D or certain ones will, will pay for them. There's a question about hemiplegic migraine, which is migraine with weakness on one side, usually on one side. It could be both, but usually one side. Sometimes there's numbness and vision, but usually weakness. And true hemiplegic migraine tends to be rare. It's familial, but it can be sporadic mutation, but usually there's uh, a family history. And the issue is, can you use triptans? It's an age old issue. Is it risky? Is it risky legally? Uh, will it help? Uh, and at the moment, I don't believe there's a contraindication for Ubrelvi. Um, and I would have to see, but I don't know if there is one for Ravau. I have to look. I don't think so. But um, Ubrelvi, theoretically, and the uh, Ditan, Lasmiditan, Ravau, theoretically, don't increase the risk for stroke. But 
All of this may change because they just came out. Um, there's a question about um, that somebody had about side effects. Um, when would you become concerned? And there's two types of side effects that the FDA looks at, that we look at. There's your regular side effects that are annoying. They can be really annoying. And then there's serious ones that could lead to a hospitalization uh, or death. And a lot of people, when they find something that works, will put up with annoying little side effects. You take a triptan like sumatriptan, you're tingly, maybe a little tired, you're willing to put up with it. But if you get severe joint pains for two days from a medicine or weeks or something like that, uh, it's not worth it. Most of our uh, side effects from our drugs, as I mentioned, are over-the-counter drugs because people mix and match. They hurt their kidneys, their stomach, and occasionally their liver uh, by taking six or eight Excedrin in a day and throwing in eight Advil. We see that uh, all the times, uh, actually. Um, so these are available. Ubrelvi is available. Rayval should be very soon. Um, now that he has the go-ahead, they were all ready. There was a question when these are going to be uh, available. Remedjapant, the newer Gpant, we're not quite sure of when that's going to uh, totally be ready. But um, we do have some hope that we need better preventives. And Remedjapant um, is working on uh, getting a preventive indication. There's another Atojapant. Uh, G-Pant that's not out, that they were working on a daily preventive, but these are not FDA indicated yet. Hopefully they will be because that, that's a huge need. One of the huge needs is uh, better preventives. Botox has helped that. Um, and Botox, we do have the advantage of 23 years of safety. We've been doing it 23 years every day. Nothing ever happens. I mean, um, it, it's really been remarkably safe as opposed to a lot of the newer drugs. So, um, you know, some people say use new drugs a lot while they're still safe. And that's, what that is, is a, it's a sort of a humorous quip, but it's, it's uh, telling and it's important because the road is littered with drugs that later on had issues and problems that we want to wait on using a lot. Um, Any other um, questions, let's see, as far as, let's see. Um, there is a question about triptans and safety. It's really had 28 years of safety. Triptans first came out in Europe. They were, I don't know if uh, any of you remember, 1993, they came out here just as the injection of sumatriptan, Imitrex, and you had to do it in the office, get an EKG, we were all afraid, and over time, these looked safer and safer. Um, so a question about rebound side effects and ubrelvi, we won't know for a while, but in the studies, there's no indication that there's rebound, but they didn't power it enough and look specifically, do a big study on rebound, but it doesn't look like it. Uh, ubrelvi you can use, um, it has 50s and 100s, and you can use up to 200 milligrams in, in 24 hours. Uh, so if you take 50 to start, you could take 100 two hours later. If you take 100 to start, 50 two hours later. We'll probably start most people on 50s is um, what I suspect. Um, question of high blood pressure and the monoclonal antibodies. So CGRP, as I mentioned, is all over the system. It maintains homeostasis or maintains systems in our system, and blood pressure is one of them. I worried about CGRP injections causing high blood pressure and making it worse. There have been a few patients, it's not been a common side effect, but um, it has happened. Now, the recovery time from side effects of the injections, most people, they go away within a month or two or three. The injections with a 30-day half-life Generally, you need five half-lives to totally get out of your system or pretty much physiologically get out of the system. So that's a long time. That's five months. 
or almost with these drugs. Most people, side effects go away relatively fast. After uh, six weeks off, two months off, uh, you have a lot less in your system, but not everybody. Some people have a fragile GI system. And they've had a monoclonal antibody and then they have nausea for months or a long time. Or they have a fragile brain, mood-wise, and they're pushed into severe depression. I've seen that where it doesn't necessarily get better right away. I think eventually it usually does, but we're still in the early stages of figuring out. Uh, it's not like we're 25 years down the road. Now, uh, some people are saying you can get uh, triptan is very cheap. It's true. Risatriptan is now down to a dollar a pill or less. Sumatriptan is certainly um, in some uh, centers 50, 60 cents a pill. Some of the others are more expensive, but even Treximit, which is a nice combination. Treximit has a naproxen and sumatriptan, but the generic naproxen and sumatriptan, people have tried this for 18 years since it came out or so, or 20, uh, never worked as well. And there's reasons for that. The sumatriptan is different in the Treximit and the naproxen is different. So there are reasons why they don't work quite as well. Um, question about DHE, it does come as an in IV that you can get in the office or the IC, in the uh, hospital or infusion center. Usually people are in the hospital, but DHE, you can give yourself a shot subcutaneously with a regular syringe. There is a nasal spray of DHE, migranol. It doesn't work very well and it stuffs up the nose. So most people don't like it. Uh, there's another new branded nasal spray of sumatriptan called Tosimra, T-O-S-Y-M-R-A, Tosimra, 10 milligrams. And it's very good. It uses a, a unique patented technology that gets, it's an easy nasal spray. It gets the liquid across the membrane and the cartilage much faster. And we get, they in studies have blood levels for Tosimra almost equal to the four milligram injections. So nasal spray technology is getting better in that sense. And uh, the Tosimra is not a bad new, new product. <clears throat> Question about dizziness and blacking out with migraines, that can happen. There is vertigo migraine, but many people with migraines have a sensitive nervous system and they get dizziness very often. Um, and often we call it PPPD, persistent perceptual postural dizziness. Um, and there's a vestibular uh, association called VADA, V-A-D-A, that's very good for patients and doctors. They talk about PPD PD and migraine vertigo. It is an issue because a lot of people, the dizziness is more of a problem for than their headache. Some people just get dizziness with their migraines. Some people it's 24 seven lightheaded dizzy. A uh, question about Amavig. I think that all these have been pretty good. Uh, the monoclonals have helped some people where nothing else did. I personally think because of safety and 24 years of use that Botox should be used before the monoclonals, but not everybody is doing that uh, because we just don't see much side effects from Botox. But um, all of these have been nice to add to our armamentarium because we needed better tools in our toolkit. There are a certain percentage of people who do okay with the tablets, whether it's propranolol, amitriptyline, topiramate, and some uh, need Botox, some need the monoclonals, but it's nice that we can expand it. How we choose, there's a question, how we choose medicine. Um, there's about 50 inputs, and I have an article on this, on that practicalpainmanagement.com called um, Deconstructing the Art of Headache Medicine. And there's about 50 inputs. How many headaches people have, their age, what's happened with all the previous medicine, stomach, insomnia, comorbidities, which means other conditions like medical comorbidities, psychiatric comorbidities. And we put it all in our mix, weight gain, weight's an issue, and the top 10 list for this person is much different than the top 10 list for that person. So it's a huge difference, depends on um, all of these factors. Uh, also mom brings in her daughter, Heather, 
who's 18 and says, I say topiramate, and mom says, oh, topiramate, that almost killed me. It was a horrible drug. We have the what we call the nocebo by proxy effect. It's not going to work for Heather genetically, but also if a mom had a terrible reaction. And then there's a the placebo by proxy. If I said uh, topiramate and mom said, oh, that was the greatest drug in the history of the world, it might be good for her daughter. So we put all this together. What I'm getting at is we also take a family history for response to medicine. So there's no good algorithm that says, uh, like there is sort of for high blood pressure or diabetes, but for uh, headaches, everybody is unique, everybody is different. Um, question is, how long can the uh, monoclonal score where you don't get side effects, then can you get side effects? That happens, but side effects to these, in my experience, tend to happen in the first month or two. Um, we don't usually see people not get constipation or be fine with tiredness, nausea, and then all of a sudden after four months get that. It can happen, but it's not that common. None of these are indicated for cluster headaches as far as I know. The G pants are less mitotan. Uh, the only new indication for cluster is episodic cluster and imgality, and it is a higher dose, 300 milligrams, is actually indicated for cluster headache. We do need more medicines for cluster. We have the tryptans and oxygen, but we need uh, better ones. Uh, there was a question about absorption of the synthroid with the CGRPs, and I think that we do have a lot of CGRP uh, in the thyroid, in the brain, in what we call the HPA axis, which involves hormones throughout, um, and I think that leads to some of these side effects that we've seen from the monoclonals, like severe tiredness, etc. cetera. Um, question about if the monoclonals were increasing blood pressure, should the person stay on it? And I think it's complicated. Say you finally found something that helped chronic migraine, you had struggled, nothing helps, and you find a drug, say it's an injection of a monoclonal like Amavig or HOV, and your blood pressure goes up. It might be risk benefit if you can treat the blood pressure. I don't love treating side effects to one drug with another drug, but sometimes if it's the only thing that's helped somebody, we would do it. So say some of these blood pressure is usually 120 over 80. We want it 120 over 80 on average or so in much older ages, 75 up, will go with a higher blood pressure for various reasons. But say somebody's 120 over 80, their blood pressure, and they get an injection, monoclonal or whatever, and their headaches get a lot better, but their blood pressure is 150 over 95. That's a significant increase. Um, we might treat that and use an ARB like losartan or something appropriate because it might be the first thing that's helped. But in general, I don't love treating uh, side effects to one drug with, with, another, uh, with another drug unless we can just do anything else. Um, question is how we would treat hemiplegic migraine. We tend to stay away from vasoconstrictors like tryptans. So we use steroids, corticosteroids in low doses, prednisone, not every day, but as needed. Uh, Depakote, which uh, is valproate, can be used as a daily preventive, but also as needed, but not if pregnancy is a possibility. We use it as needed though. Sometimes we use some of the uh, amitriptyline or even quetiapine as needed. But we'll use uh, tor ketorolac or Sprix, which are don't shrink the arteries. These are um, Toradol, ketorolac. Um, basically, we'll throw everything at hemiplegic migraine, uh, even some of the pain medicines or butalbital, et cetera, that's not a vasoconstrictor. Some doctors do use vasoconstrictors like DHE, which doesn't really shrink the arteries. It's more of a vein constrictor. It's safer but it's controversial whether to use those or not. Um, the issue is, can you use sumatriptan or ketorolac while waiting for Ubrelvi to kick in? I wouldn't use it right away or together. We don't know yet, so I'm waiting two, three, four hours between triptans and Ubrelvi. We just don't know yet. They can be used in the same day, but I would wait. Um, you can use, though, a NSAID 
with UBRELV, and the NSAID will not materially cause um, an interaction, but the tryptans, I'm waiting a little bit. You can use them in the same day, but not at the same time. Um, question is uh, about histamine levels being increased on amovig. Histamine is in mast cells, and theoretically, we don't want mast cells, which are part of your immune system around the system, around the brain, to degranulate, we call it, and release all of these chemicals. And CGRP helps do that. So if we block CGRP, we should theoretically get less histamine. None of, nothing's new in medicine. I started looking at mast cells and degranulation and convinced the immune system was a key in 1988, and we published studies on it then. There's actually studies going on histamine and headache back to um, 1938, believe it or not. Uh, so uh, in 1900, we were sneaking in aspirin from Canada for um, because it was cheaper in Canada. We're still sneaking in medicines to the United States from Canada. So a lot of things uh, never change, actually. Question of um, side effects. There's a lot of questions of side effects and the injectables, and we do get them. I've mentioned them, but I don't want to be too much of a negative Nancy. These have transformed some people's lives. Uh, these have been life-changing for some people. What I do also worry about is even in the high responders that they wear out. Botox doesn't seem to usually wear out. Sometimes the monoclonal antibodies, unfortunately, um, can wear out. So I think we're nearing um, the end, uh, people have asked uh, just one or two more questions about losing hair. That can happen with the monoclonals. It's not in the package insert, but it's definitely what we call a signal. They talk about signals in the FDA and studies. Uh, depression is, nausea is, and I believe hair loss or hair thinning. And it depends how much the drug has helped somebody's life. We could switch to a different form of monoclonal and see but sometimes when you switch, they don't work as well either. So it's a difficult choice. In general, when hair loss is from a drug, it usually comes back or it should almost always uh, off the drug, but it may take a while. So this recording is gonna be available, I believe. They usually archive it. Um, and I'd love to come back and talk about all of this stuff, each of these uh, side effects and trials or new or old medicines or how we choose can each be uh, a nice hour. Um, I think we're about out of questions. Um, there was a question, if CGRP wears off, have we seen success with a different one? So. Back in March on practical pain management, I, I published on that. I think I posted it on the group here. It was called One Year Experience with CGRP. We looked at switching from Ajovi to Mgality to Amovig, back and forth. We looked up and down. In general, if one of these has a lack of efficacy, uh, say it's not working very well, it's not worth it, it's helping 10%, 0%, Switching, we only get 25%, 27% do well. If it's because of side effects, switching, we might do better in the 30 percentile. If it's because of money, their insurance won't pay for this one, but they'll pay for another one, but it's been working and we switch, we get a good 58% or more relief. So it's not great, but I do think that it's worth switching and trying, we have had some success. Sometimes we go back to, say, the original one. So somebody's on Amovig, they're getting constipated. They want to switch. We go back, uh, we go over to Mgality, they don't do that great. We go to Ajovi, say they do better, constipation's better, but they say, this happens not that un, uh, uncommonly, I actually was better off on the original Amovig and I'll deal with the constipation. So we end up going back to it. So that happens too, but it, I think it is worth switching. Um, so uh, Shash Rachel said that the recording will be available. 
and they'll put it on YouTube also. Um, it's a question about G pants with kidney failure. So G pants are metabolized through the liver, the liver system, but with advanced kidney failure, they recommend not using them, I believe. Uh, and the newer lasmiditan, the Ravau, is metabolized a number of ways. It does go through the kidneys, it goes through other systems. Um, but I think with advanced kidney disease, they want you staying off of these is the issue. Well, I wanna thank you very much. Um, I'll come back anytime. Um, it's been great. Thank you for all the questions. And I know a number of you have emailed me or we have a, uh, through our website, we have a daily blog and people put messages on and I try to answer every message off of our blog. It's on Facebook. The blog is Robin's Headache Clinic uh, Facebook. Um, so we can keep touch. I've talked about on our blog about everything, G pants and the monoclonals and pluses and minuses. So thank you very much.